This is Tyler, your antisocial critic and the host of the Antisocial Network, your number one source for anachronistic conversations online. Come join us each week to hear opinions from some of the best voices discussing entertainment, politics, religion, and modern life on the internet today. Most of which you've never heard of, but I have. Joining us this week is Jennifer Greenberg, author of Not Forsaken, and she runs her own... Uh, I actually don't know the full extent of your ministry and everything you do, but I know you do some. You do online abuse advocacy and you talk with a lot of people. Can you kind of explain the full breadth of your work? Yeah, so um, I've done a lot of work writing about um, <clears throat> from the perspective of a survivor, um, trying to help people understand um, the importance of the issue, um, the gravity of the issue, the prevalence of it, um, and most importantly, how to identify abuse so that you can report it and um, or intervene, how, you know, whatever is, uh, is relevant in the particular case that you're encountering. Um, and also just to you know, be able to encourage uh, victims and survivors in a, in a helpful and um, gospel-centered way. So um, what kind of like, I guess the big thing was, of course, my book, Not Forsaken, um, that came out last year, which, you know, feels like 10 years ago, but it was only last year and late <laughs> last year at that. Um, so, yeah, it, it feels like it's been forever, but it, it's really only, I don't think it's, yeah, it's been out barely a year. It, it turned one year old on August 20th. So um, I released that and then um, a couple months, well, in this past August, I released a shepherd's guide, not forsaken a shepherd's guide, which is actually a free download through my website, which is jennifergreenberg.net. Um, so the shepherd's guide goes chapter by chapter through not forsaken. It's just a PDF download, um, but it's, it's geared towards um, shepherds, right? So pastors, church leaders, counselors, law enforcement officers. Um, I even had a, a dad recently uh, messaged me and said that his, his he had found out that his daughter had been um, abused and he downloaded the shepherd's guide and because of the shepherd's guide he knew how to report and he knew who to talk to and how to get her help and and he knew the right questions to ask you know her therapist and what kind of therapist to look for and so just getting that feedback I mean it's just that's the change that that we really need and and that the help that people really need because you know when you find yourself in a situation where you've been abused or your kid's been abused or your friend has been abused it's overwhelming and trying to figure out who to talk to and how to file that report is it's it can be a nightmare when you're already overwhelmed and so part of my goal with that shepherd's guide is to just like basically it's it's very in-depth, but basically just to give people a bullet point look, list, you know, like when you see this, this, or this, these are the people you talk to, these are the questions you ask, you know, and so to try, kind of try to help people in that overwhelming situation so that they have direction. And so that's been a big part of my ministry. And of course, you know, I write for, um, I write for various media outlets like the Gospel Coalition and um, the ERLC, Crossroads, um, you know, a handful of different, different publications like that. And, um, you know, doing stuff on podcasts like yours. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just, I mean, you know, it's just a matter of getting the conversation going, um, you know, and, and making it not an awkward thing to talk about because, you know, let's face it, everybody has bad things happen to them. Everybody has different challenges in their lives. Um, this, unfortunately, dealing with other people's sin including the sin of abuse is sadly it's it's common and so this you know it shouldn't be an awkward conversation um it's certainly not something that i as a as a victim or a survivor should be ashamed of you know these things happen to good people and innocent people um and even children and so you know just basically normalizing this topic and saying yes it's it's good to talk about these things it's good to stand up against um, a sin and evil, and it's good to defend victims, and and that's really what it comes down to. Okay, I read a little bit of the book last night, just so I could kind of get a 
bit of not go into this 100% blind like I was joking about on Twitter, but uh, you said in the introduction that you wrote this as a, it started as a letter to your husband. Can you kind of talk about how this came about then? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, as as a, an abuse survivor, um, I'm married to this great guy who has, you know, thank God he's never suffered abuse. Um, and so, you know, naturally in marriage, there's always going to be, you know, the big, the big struggle is communication, right? You know, we, um, we often joke about, you know, um, men are from Mars, women are from Venus or, you know, two different languages or whatever. Um, but I think, you know, when you come from very different backgrounds, um, you know, those things are more of a challenge. And so one of the things that I really wanted Jason to understand was, you know, where I come from, um, why I am the way that I am. And uh, so that we could facilitate good communication in our marriage. And, um, you know, so I, I, I kind of sat down to uh, write him a series of letters um, explaining, I guess, you know, it's like, well, you know, why I, maybe why I struggle with depression or struggle with anxiety, why I've had to cut off certain relatives, you know, loved ones, people I still care about who are just simply not healthy for me to be around. Um, you know, just to explain all those things in writing, because it's so hard, you know, when you're talking about deeply personal issues, it's so hard to, um, particularly the first time you've explained them, to do it verbally to someone's face, especially to someone that you love, because you know that they're going to be upset. You know that they're going to be angry at your abuser or that this happened or, you know, they're going to be concerned. And so um, writing it was a way for me to kind of word everything perfectly, um, say everything in a very measured way and not necessarily be in the room when you read it. You know what I mean? Um, And uh, so... But then as I started writing these these letters, um, they they turned into chapters. And, you know, I started realizing this, you know, this is not only something that's helping my marriage, this is something that's helping me. This is helping me understand what I went through. And, um, and it's actually teaching me, uh, it's showing me God's hand in my life. You know, I, I had never realized, and I don't, I still don't think I realized fully, but I'd never realized the degree to which God had intervened in my life and kept me safe and preserved my faith despite so many horrible things. Um, And so that was really eye-opening to me. And I started thinking, you know, if this can help me and Jason, what if it could help other people too? And so then I showed it to, um, I showed a couple draft chapters to my, um, my pastor at the time. And, uh, and he said, Jennifer, this is, this is really important. This is an important book. This isn't, this isn't just, you know, a, a series of articles or letters. This is, this is a book. And, um, this is something that could help change the way the church responds to abuse or handles abuse. And that just kind of blew my mind. And I became more determined than ever to, um, to finish it (laughs) and, and to get it to a publisher. And, you know, it was, it was kind of an amazing, um, an amazing journey. You know, I, I sent it to a handful of people who are just extremely encouraging. And then I, I ended up getting followed actually on Twitter by the good book. And I looked at their catalog of books and, you know, I saw, um, Sarah Walton's book and I saw, um, I saw Tim Keller and I saw, you know, John Piper and, you know, just books about handling depression and handling struggles. And I was like this, you know, my book could really fit in this catalog. And so I sent it, um, I sent my manuscript in and like within, I think like 10 business days or 10, just 10, any days, they wrote back and were like, Hey, when can, you know, when can we get you a, when do we need to get you an offer by? And so that was, I mean, that's like unheard of, you know, I was expecting to like, best case scenario, I thought I'd hear back in six months, you know, best case. I didn't expect to hear back at all. Um, so that was just, I mean, it was, it was obvious from the beginning that God's hand was in it. It's been a really exciting journey. To, to double back a little bit, yeah. what was your husband's reaction to it? Because it sounds like in the book, it sounds like 
you you seem to have found someone who's very kind of perfect. Like <laughs> you talk, you talk very kindly of him, and I get the sense that that's very important given what kind of damage that abuse can do to person make in reflecting in how you process masculinity and yes. men in general. What is that? What is your as a and a second as a secondary question? What is your relationship with Ben like as you've been processing all this stuff with him? Yeah, well, you know, um, it's funny. My well, my husband's reaction. <clears throat> Well, he's a very, first of all, he's a very calm, laid back person. Um, you know, he, he gets excited about, you know, certain things like he loves his music. He plays guitar and he loves, um, you know, fantasy and sci-fi literature. He loves, you know, Lord of the Rings and, um, you know, he gets excited about certain things, but they're positive things. They're good things. And so, you know, when he started reading my writing, I think... I think for him, well, it was, he was, from my perspective, he was calm. Um, but I think it was, I think he was very sad and also just had kind of a deeper anger for, you know, what had happened to his wife, um, what had been done to her. And, you know, what's funny is like, I've, I've had, um, messages from a couple of husbands and they said, you know, my wife recently told me that she's been abused and I'm just angry, but at the same time, I don't want to scare her. And, you know, what do I do? You know, cause I have all this anger and I don't know what to do. And I'm afraid of, of traumatizing my wife further. And I was like, you know what? When, when Jason told me that he was angry at my abuser, that was such a comfort to me because I knew that I had a godly man who was protective of me and who was angry over evil. I mean, that's righteous anger. You know, that's not, that's not just, you know, selfish anger or vengeful anger or hateful anger. Well, it may be vengeful, but it's not, it's not revengeful in a, in a sinful sort of way. It's, it's, why did you do this to my wife? And why did you hurt her? And, and how could you do this to a child? And those are, those are good questions and those are good things to be angry over. And so, you know, as an abuse survivor also, you know, I've been angry. And so to have someone that we can mutually be upset that these things happened, we can mutually recognize that this is evil and that this person did bad things. Um, that was really important. I think actually for us to grow together in our marriage through that, cause we were able to process that together and, and grieve, you know, anger is a, it's a, it's a step in the grieving process. It's an aspect of, of, of grieving evil and grieving really like a kind of death, you know, spiritual death. And, you know, so to be able to go through that grieving process together, um, I feel it really made our marriage stronger. Um, and as to your, you know, your second question, um, you know, Jason, right from the get go, when we got married, um, he's been just a very patient and loving person. And because of that, I was able to realize what an impatient and unloving person my dad was. Um, I knew even when I was a child that my dad had what I called anger issues. Um, but I didn't realize how abusive he was and really that he had committed crimes until I guess probably my late teens, early twenties. And it probably wasn't until I was in my mid twenties to late twenties that I realized, um, the extent, the severity of, of a lot of those sins and crimes. Um, and that was due a large, in large part to just being able to see my husband and see the contrast, which he created in my life. Right. So suddenly I was, you know, I was 21, I was a newlywed and I'm living with this guy who actually is interested in, in my opinions and cares about my feelings and wants to help build my career and wants to encourage my, my music and my, my writing, even though those things weren't, you know, uh, contributing to our finances at all. Um, he wanted to encourage those things and, and build me up and help me recover. And any, he, he treated my emotions as, as valuable. You know, he wanted to know how I felt and that was such 
a contrast to the way my dad had always treated me because my dad had always, you know, been like, oh, you you know, you're upset because I treated you that this way. Well, that's all in your head or that's, you know, you're stop being a crazy, a crazy emotional woman, you know, it's just, you know, suck it up. Um, you know, this is, this is all in your imagination, which of course is gaslighting. And, you know, it's, it's basically when we, when we try to, not we, obviously, but when an abuser um, tries to convince their victim that not to trust their own um, uh, intelligence, their own reason, their own instincts, their own emotions, we call that gaslighting. And so that was a, a heavy form of abuse uh, for me growing up. And, and so when Jason suddenly cared about what I thought, and said, no, you know what? The reason you're depressed is because you've had a depressing childhood. The reason you're anxious and stressed is because you've had incredibly stressful things happen to you. And the reason you're angry is because you're angry over evil. And so to have someone validate my emotions, um, it was just like, it was like suddenly gasping air after being held underwater for a very long time. It was, it was shocking really. And, um, and, and, you know, it was painful because I had to process the fact that my dad was a very damaged and very damaging individual and um, ended up having to cut him out of my life. But honestly, that was one of the healthiest and best things I've ever done for myself. <laughs> so that was a long answer to your question, but yes. <laughs> was was there an initial... Uh trepidations when you started courting with Jason was about trying to uh, making sure he was going to be what, what was your what when you first met him and started dating him what was your emotional processing like and realizing that he wasn't going to be like that you know I was okay so at the time there were two things happening it's very hard to explain um on the one hand I was in a deep state of denial I didn't want to admit that my dad was abusive and I don't think I understood I just didn't abuse was all I had known and so I thought my dad was normal um, so there was there was a blend of naivety but there was also a deep intrinsic desire to believe my dad was still a Christian and to believe that he was safe and that he was gonna be the grandparent of my children someday I really 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 wanted to um, have a good dad and believe that I had a good dad and so I did um, even though I you know I was in recognition too at simultaneously that he had some very severe issues um, but then Jason came along and he's this quiet safe loving um, guy and by the way at the time he was not a Christian and so it was um, on the one hand I loved my dad, but on the other hand, I was like, I need to get out. I need to get away from my dad. I need to. And there were a couple times even when we were, when Jason and I were dating where I called him on the phone at like 11 or midnight and said, I, you know, come to my house. I've packed up my clothes and I'm going to climb out my bedroom window and let's just run away together. And he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> he was like, that would not be a good idea. You know, he kind of talked me down. <laughs> kind of talked me down from doing that, you know, and said, okay, what's going on? You know, calm down. You know, we'll, we're still, we're going out on a date tomorrow. It's going to be okay. And, you know, and so, at, but at, again, at that time, you know, because I was in denial and because I so dearly loved my dad, I, I didn't tell Jason, um, you know, about a lot of the physical violence that was going on. And so he didn't know. He knew that my dad was a jerk and he knew that he was mean, but he didn't know that I was physically in danger. And so, um, and again, I thought that was normal. Um, so it was, um, it was strange. So like, I think on, it's like on my, on a conscious level, I, I was in denial, but on a state. Okay, uh, let me check real quick.
<clears throat> Can you hear me? Skype froze up. I can't hear you at the moment. He's an escape route. I want him because... Hey, I, I, because my Skype froze him. up for like and 30 seconds. Did you hear me? Did it? Did it? Okay. So I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, I, I struggled um, for quite some time, um, you know, with God. And I prayed to God, you know, that you need to show me, um, clarify this situation for me. Because I wanted to marry Jason because I love him. Right. I didn't want to marry him because he was a way out of my home. I didn't want to marry him because he was an escape route. Um, I wanted to marry him because we were really in love and he was really the one for me. And so I told God, I was like, I need I need you to give me a sign that that Jason is going to become a Christian and that this is that this is your plan in my life. And, you know, I, I prayed that I, I told God, I was like, I need, I need you to give me a sign that you can hear me and give me a sign that you're going to save Jason. And this probably sounds kind of superstitious, but I, I flipped open my Bible, closed my eyes, pointed to a verse and, uh, it was a chapter in Isaiah. I'm not going to remember the chapter number now, but it was, the verse was behold, the Lord's ear is not dull that he cannot hear you, nor is his hand shortened that he will not save. And that was the answer to my two questions. And within a week, just a couple days later, Jason called me on the phone and he said, Jennifer, you know, I was reading my Bible and I decided to pray and I actually felt like, like God heard me, like he was listening. And shortly thereafter, he, um, he had a meeting with our, our pastor at the time and uh, he was baptized and he became a Christian. And I want to say five or six months later, we got married and um, it's been 14 years now. So we're, we're very happy. Um, and I can honestly say that I'm at a better place spiritually than I ever have been. Um, so God's, God's been very faithful to me. Because, you know, at 21, when I married Jason, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I mean, who does at 21? But, you know, my idea, my definition of masculinity, of fatherhood, of what a good husband should look like was all skewed by, by abuse um, and by that toxic home environment that I grew up in. And just by God's grace, I married a man who was a genuine believer and we've grown so much together and it's been, it's just been a huge blessing. So in, in regards to the book then, is it, I kind of got the sense reading the uh, first few chapters that the book's primarily about working through trauma and kind of identifying uh, abuse. Uh, is that primarily what the focus of the the, uh, the book as a whole is or what is the, what is it? That's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's accurate. So like if you, um, and I'll just, you know, open up the table of contents here to give myself some, refresh my memory here. It's been a very long year. 2020 feels like a death. <laughs> yeah, it, it just feels it's like gonna... I wrote this ten years ago. It really does. Um, so the first chapter, and it, you know, for survivors, for people with just very sensitive hearts, um, if you're concerned about reading accounts of abuse and concern that that might be triggering or overly stressful, the majority, and I, I want to say, if not all of the accounts of abuse in my book are in that first chapter, which is titled, This Is My Story. And so if you're concerned about being triggered by those, you can just skip the first chapter. We did that on purpose so that you could just skip it and, and move on to the happier, more healing stuff. Um, so that first chapter is just to establish my history, um, demonstrate, you know, that, that yes, I understand you know, on some level at least, what you've gone through, what what abuse is like, whether that be domestic violence or sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, psychological, emotional abuse. Um, the third chap, you know, the second chapter is just wrestling with, the, okay, was I abused? What was my abuse? You know, were crimes committed? Because that's, that's a huge, um, I wanna say a first step. You know, when you come out of that denial phase, 
um, or that phase of naivety when you realize, oh my goodness, my relationship with my parents or my relationship with my spouse or whoever it may be was not normal. Um, and so just trying to kind of figure out like what the heck happened to me? Um, the third chapter is Jesus wept. And honestly, this to me was the most pivotal chapter to write because I was able to connect on an emotional level with Jesus. And when you think about it, how amazing is that, that we have a God who became human so that we could connect with him on an emotional level. We can emotionally connect with the God who created the stars. I mean, that's just, that's mind blowing to me. And so being able to go through Jesus story and say, you know what? Jesus was gaslighted. People called him a drunk. People said he was demon possessed. They said he was a liar. They, um, you know, they said he was crazy. They gaslighted him. That's emotional abuse. That's psychological abuse. I can relate with Jesus because of that. And, and then to realize that Jesus was beaten up. He was, he was, uh, he was betrayed by his, his family, his loved ones. Um, he was, he was slandered. He was gossiped about. He was beaten up and nailed to a cross. He, and he hung naked on that cross. So, you know, you want to talk about, um, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, violence. He, he's been there and, and he was even murdered. And so, so there's, there's no trauma that our God can't relate with. And to me, that was just profoundly comforting to know that when I weep, Jesus is weeping too. And when Jesus sees, um, or when he saw the abuse that I endured, he was angry for me and he was sad for me and, and he's perfectly just, and he doesn't forget. So he remembers even things my abuser did that I don't remember. He remembers every cruel word. He even knows my abuser's mean, dirty thoughts. And he will judge evil at the last day. And so that, that is profoundly comforting to me because I know that even if I don't get justice in this life, um, Jesus will, um, will bring justice because he is justice. Um, chapter four, concussion of the heart is dealing with PTSD. So, um, I'm, I'm drawing an analogy there between, you know, if you get hit on the head really hard, um, you're going to feel dizzy. You're going to feel disoriented. You're going to be in a lot of pain. Just so when we have, when we encounter a traumatic event, when we are, um, we have a concussion of the heart, we're going to be emotionally disoriented and emotionally confused and emotionally in a lot of pain, um, dealing with these feelings of guilt. Uh, that's chapter five. Um, you know, whether that be that guilt be justified because, you know, we're all sinners or, um, what I call uh, borrowed guilt. That's when, um, we think, oh, well, what if, what if I'd been wearing a different outfit? Maybe he wouldn't have done that. Maybe if I had, you know, kept the house cleaner, maybe if I had not been so obnoxious, maybe if I weren't so stupid, maybe if I hadn't gone to that party, whatever it may be, that's borrowed guilt. You know, that's, you know, your abuser's sin is your abuser's sin. You know, sure. I repent of my own sin, but I can't take responsibility for somebody else's. Um, and you know, so I just go through all these different issues. Um, of course we talked, we talked about fatherhood. That's chapter 11 is recovering fatherhood, understanding what God means when he calls himself our father. Cause he's not an angry authoritarian controlling father. He's a loving father, um, a forgiving father. And then of course that's followed by the truth about forgiveness and defining love, which <clears throat> I realized as I struggled through writing this book um, that I didn't have a good grasp of what biblical <clears throat> forgiveness is um, because in my home um, when my my parents demanded that I forgive first of all there was no repentance um, okay so that's a big problem it, um, but secondly when they said forgive what they really meant was stop talking about this Let's put this in the past, you know, forgive and forget, forget being 
the important aspect of it, you know? And so forgive, if you forgave someone, that negated justice, that negated dealing with the problem, that negated holding um, my parents accountable for their sin, that negated getting help that I desperately needed. And so that was a very toxic and unbiblical definition of forgiveness. Um, and then of course, love too, you know, understanding what, what is love, you know, so often as abuse survivors, when we think of love, we think of, um, something that's tinged with maybe jealousy or manipulation or desire to control or, or something that's selfish or possessive, but in a biblical sense, love, you know, there's, there's different kinds of love. There's, there's love where we're just sacrificially, we love someone, um, you know, despite their, their issues, despite what they've done. But then there's also an element of love where if we truly love, um, someone, we are going to hold them accountable. We're going to make sure that they, um, that they confront their sin, that they're aware of their sin. You know, sometimes the most loving thing we can do is call 911 on someone because that's what it's going to take to get them to deal with their issues and also to keep other people who we love from getting hurt. Um, so, uh, you know, just redefining in my head what love meant was was a huge process for me. Um, but I've kind of recorded that whole journey in my book, Not Forsaken, and I'm hopeful that it helps not only abuse survivors, but also their, their loved ones, um, their spouses, their pastors, their counselors, to kind of understand to a deeper and more personal degree the uh, complexity of the journey that recovery is. What's uh, you, we, uh, we touched a little bit initially about uh, other people's reaction to the book, but what's when you have any your experience since it's come out? Have you then we have a lot of people reached out to you? What is the oh, yeah? What has that been like? <sighs> it's been incredible. Um, I had a a young mom who's an abuse survivor said that her husband read it. She didn't read it because she was afraid that it would be, um, she was afraid that it would be triggering. Um, but uh, her husband read it and she said, my husband understands me better. He understands where I'm coming from better. And because of that, our marriage has actually grown stronger. That was one of the initial responses I got. Um, I've gotten responses from a handful of abuse survivors who actually said, I was really close to committing suicide and your book changed my mind. And to me, that, that just was overwhelming. I mean, that's not me. That's not my writing. That's not my publisher. That's just God um, working through um, my story and my, my work. And so that's just been... The feedback's been incredible, and I've heard, I've heard from um, seminary professors and pastors as well who have just said, you know, this this is something that I recommend to my colleagues, my friends. Oh, the call killed itself. Let me fix that real quick. <laughs> Hey. Hello. <laughs> hey, so. Very somber moment for it to crash, but. Right, yeah. Let me see. Can I? Okay, there we go. I'm going to try this. Hopefully, this will work a little better. I don't know. The video might be a little different, but I'm hoping that does not happen again. So, sorry about that. It um... happens. Okay, so we have, we have at least start... one technical failure per stream, so. Okay. So I'm just going to start from the beginning when you asked um, what the feedback has been. Well, I, I heard up until like the last second. It was till like till like a couple seconds ago. So you were talking about a husband who'd heard from, who who had learned okay. about his spouse. And so. Yeah, yeah. So I, I heard from you know the young wife, and then I've also heard from a handful of abuse survivors who, um, who said that probably like five or six people who said that they were actually um, struggling with suicidal levels of depression and that reading my book helped them choose to stay alive. And for me that, you know, that's just, 
that's miraculous. You know, that's, that's not, that's not me. That's not my publisher. That's not, um, that's not my writing skill or anything like that. That's just, that's God. And so that, that was really humbling to hear. Um, I've also heard from, um, a lot of pastors and seminary professors who said that they've recommended it to their, their colleagues, their students, their, their friends, um, you just said, this is, you know, if you're a pastor, you're going to be a pastor. This is mandatory reading. You need to understand what it's like to, um, you know, for, to survive abuse because you're going to have people in your congregation, um, you know, or you're going to meet people along your, along the road of life who have been through this and you need to understand, um, how to respond to that well and how to sympathize with them. Um, so that's just, I mean, seeing how God, God has worked through this. I mean, it was, you know, literally nine months of my life, uh, writing the manuscript and then I don't know, maybe a year editing it. Um, but to see God, you know, in the vast scheme of things, when you look at just all of history, that's just such a microscopic blip in time. Right. But to see God use that microscopic blip to, to change lives and to, to further the gospel and to enable the ministry of so many pastors and, and husbands and wives and, and teachers. Um, it's been extremely humbling and, and just overjoying, you know, to see how he uses sorrow and he uses struggle and, and even other people's evil. He uses that to, to spread the gospel and to give hope. This has been beautiful. I can imagine. I mean, just, just looking at, I mean, obviously I, I don't know you personally. I've only, I see you very, I, as a, at a distance because of Twitter and yeah. Skype, but <laughs> I, I see in a lot of the way you are now, kind of the fruits of the spirit. I think that there's a lot of, a lot of inspiring stuff to your ministry and being able to create a life Thank of you. joy out of everything, which I think that's some of the most, that some of the some of the best thing you can do in life it really yeah it's well you know it's funny i was i was reading um with our small group uh last night i was reading uh philippians one where paul you know he's imprisoned and he's he says you know whether by life or by death you know god will be glorified and you know no matter how much we suffer in this world god's gonna he's going to work through it, you know, to live as Christ and to die as gain. And I really think that, you know, one thing that the church can learn, um, as, as difficult as, and, and painful as it is to talk about abuse, to, to deal with this topic, I think it's incredibly important because when we read the Bible, you know, whether we're talking about someone in the old Testament, like Joseph, who was beaten up by his own brothers and sold into human slave and sold into slavery. I mean, we're talking about domestic violence there. We're talking about human trafficking there, you know, or whether you talk about Paul who was beaten up, who was falsely imprisoned. Um, that's abuse when, and you know, Jesus Christ, again, that's, he suffered abuse. Um, this is, and you know, as, as ugly as I know that some people consider this topic, the gospel is that Jesus Christ um, saves us out of sin. And sin is ugly and it's messy and it's not something we like to think about. But if we don't face sin, if we try to ignore it, if we try to sweep it under the rug, then what ends up happening is that we minimize grace. You know, when we minimize the depravity, the, um, the darkness of evil, when we minimize that, when we hide that, we are by, we are actually, what we're effectively doing is we're minimizing the mercy of God. We're minimizing his salvation and, and his, his goodness, because how do we know how good Jesus is, how merciful Jesus is? Well, because he became human, he entered a dark and weary and dying world to save sinners. And so I, the way I view this, you know, a lot of times we talk about the abuse crisis in the church. 
I would really like the Church of God to view it as an opportunity to share the gospel and to help people who need the gospel, because that's really what it is. Uh, just uh, just to close, I, I was going to say, what would you offer as advice to anyone who's going through abuse right now who's listening? But I, my first thought was, well, I have a book you could read, but... Uh, <laughs> What would, what would you, your offer if anyone listening needs to hear some of this, like to needs to hear something? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, first of all, I would encourage you by saying that God understands what you are going through. Um, you know, I went through a period where I was angry at God because I didn't understand, you know, it's like, God, you're good and you're sovereign. So, you know, why did you let these things happen to me? Um, you could have, you could have struck my dad with lightning. You could have, um, you could have woken somebody up to some red flag. You could have involved the police. You could have, you could have saved my dad. You could have softened his heart and changed him. You know, why didn't you do these things? Why did you, um, why did you let me suffer this way? And can't answer those questions still for you. There's no, um, you know, as a human being, I don't have God's eyes. When I look at my life, when I look at the world, I can't see the big picture. I can't see what he's doing. Um, so, but what I can tell you is that you can ask God those questions, you know, just as Jacob wrestled with God, just as Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, Lord, you know, if it be your will, take this cup from me. You know, I don't want to go through this hardship. Um, it, it is it is natural and it is sane to not want to suffer. <laughs> um, but we can pour our hearts out to God. And if you're angry at God, you can tell God about it. You know, for a long time, I I tried to hide my anger from God. But then it just sort of one day it clicked and I was like, you know what? God knows everything. So he knows I'm mad at him. He knows I'm deeply distressed. And there's, you know, if I, if I pray to him and I um, read the Bible and I'm pretending like I'm okay with him, then it's kind of like lying to God. And so I need to just tell God how I feel. And you know what I did? And in response, God gave me such a profound feeling of peace. And that's not to say that I never struggled again. That's not to say that I never got angry again or got upset or got depressed or anxious or afraid. But it drew me closer to God and it gave me a deeper relationship with him. And ultimately, you know what? Here I am. I have a good marriage. I have three beautiful children. I'm I'm happy. I'm healthy. I'm, you know, I'm relatively safe as far as safe goes. Um, you know, we don't, we can't, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We don't know the future. Um, maybe tomorrow I'll be at home with Jesus. Maybe I'll still be here working on my ministry, you know, but either way, I have a God, I have a Father in Heaven who is faithful, and I have a Savior who loves me and who understands everything that I've been through. And so I would just encourage you, no matter where you are in that journey, spiritually, physically, um, confide in the Lord. And you know, and if you are in a place where you feel like you're not physically safe, um, please, please talk to law enforcement. Please get help. Um, don't be there alone. Um, and if you are in a place where you just feel like you're emotionally being abused, you know, you can still reach out to law enforcement. You can, you can reach out to, um, pastors, to other Christians, to counselors, to therapists, you know, again, do not walk that road alone. Um, because we, you know, in the beginning, you know, when God created man, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. And that's why he created Eve. Um, but that concept is, it's not limited to marriage. We are not meant to be alone. We are meant to have friends. We're meant to, um, to walk through these struggles together. Um, and first, you know, Philippians again, you know, talks about that. We are meant to strive, um, in one spirit 
against oppression and against evil um, because we love Jesus Christ. So that that is my my encouragement to you. All right. Thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Tyler. I really appreciate um, you uh, taking the effort to track me down too. <laughs> very kind of you. I know it's been it's been hard with scheduling, but we made it happen. Trust me, you're you're not the most uh, uh, troubling uh, scheduling guest I've had. <laughs> Even. <Okay. laughs> Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> as a mom of three, and then just as an artsy person in general, I feel like I'm all over the place sometimes. So I, I genuinely appreciate when someone's like, it's like, um, and I've told people this before, if I don't respond to you on Twitter, email me. If I don't respond to you on email, text me. You know, it's nothing personal. Like, I really want to connect with you. I'm just going 20 different directions. So, but... I appreciate it. I appreciate your time and your ministry with this podcast. Thank you. There you go. God bless. Have God a good bless day. you too. <laughs> the Antisocial Network is a Grouping Productions podcast. Editing, producing, and hosting are by Tyler Hummel, artwork by Crystal Cowley, and original music was composed by Melissa Lafira and the late Dan Smola. Like, subscribe, and please let us know what you think about the show in the comments below if you'd like to see anyone interesting be a guest on the show. Thank you for listening.